Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. And today, we're going to be talking about parallel compression, but not just parallel compression, parallel processing in general. In fact, I think the term parallel compression is a bit of a misnomer because so often when parallel compression is used well, it's not just compression that's going on. It is usually one or more other types of processing in addition to parallel compression that makes parallel compression really work. Often EQ, but it can be other things like saturation and more. And we'll get more into detail and depth on that. But I really hope to give you a kind of brief, complete guide to using parallel compression on just about anything as concisely as possible. Not only am I going to give you some big principles about how to use parallel compression on practically anything you encounter. I'll also give you some specific use cases, particular instruments, drums, bass, and so many more. Those are a couple of the obvious ones, but we'll focus on not only some of the obvious applications like drums, but we'll get a little bit more esoteric, a little bit more advanced, and think about some places to use parallel processing that you might not already be using parallel compression that might really help you out. At the end, I'll cover something I haven't covered before, which is when not to use parallel compression, parallel processing. So we'll get into that. Now, this is a podcast episode, which means it's a talking format. It's not filled with a ton of audio video examples. Those are for you to create by yourself. If I did audio examples for each one of these ideas I'm going to give you today, man, this would be like a full two, three hour course length thing. And maybe someday I'll do a full length course just on parallel compression. But you can see and hear some audio examples of parallel compression and techniques like this from me and a couple other videos. I'll link them in the show notes down below. And also, of course, my full length courses like mixing breakthroughs, we go into these with some audio examples as well. But really the most important audio examples you can make are the ones you make yourself. In the podcast format, we're going to go over the big concepts in a really concise, organized, detailed way. So you can go putting some of this stuff into practice immediately. And so some of these concepts will really stick with you for the long haul. All right, let's get right into it. But before we do, the briefest of shout outs to this week's sponsors. Who are they? They are Sound Toys, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. They've got a whole bunch of great tools, many of which have a mix knob on there that's great for parallel processing. Also, big shout out and thanks to Focusrite, making some killer interfaces. They make stuff from the entry-level Scarlett line all the way up to the high-end RedNet series. Really some of the best bang for the buck stuff out there. The Scarlett series is probably the best-selling series of interfaces in the history of interfaces, and for good reason. It's really hard to get better price or performance value than you can get out of Focusrite, whether at the high-end or at the entry level. All right, let's get right into this week's episode. So I want to give you first a few big principles about parallel processing before we go even deeper into some of the specific applications. For those of you who don't know what parallel compression is or why you might want to use it, the whole idea is you basically take a track, you take a copy of it, you compress that copy really hard, and then you blend the two tracks together. So you have a uncompressed or mostly uncompressed main track with a super compressed version of that track, and you're blending the two of them together, and hopefully that combination of the two is greater than the sum of its parts. Before we get into all of the particulars and whole bunch of applications, I want to give you a few big principles about how to use parallel compression that's going to take you kind of across all these examples or common themes that are going to come up again and again. And the first big principle is something I hinted at in the intro, and that is that Really good parallel compression isn't just compression. And parallel compression is a bit of a misnomer. It's really about parallel processing in many cases, where you're coupling parallel compression, a heavily compressed track, and the uncompressed track. But that heavily compressed track is often going to be treated with other tools as well. And those other tools are almost as important as the compression. Often things like EQ, things like saturation, there can be other tools. And we'll, we'll talk about some specific applications and kind of settings you might think about on different instruments. Big principle number two around parallel compression is that, generally speaking, you're going to want to use really, really fast attack times on your parallel compressed track. And there's a really good reason for that. And this leads us to talking about the whole point of parallel compression in a little bit more detail, which is that you want to get really consistent dynamics out of your parallel compressed track. The whole point of parallel compression is to give us really consistent dynamics and a little bit more body and maybe edge to the tone, but without sucking the life out of it. 
Because to get a lot of dynamic consistency out of a track, you really need to use fast attack times to catch the initial attack, the initial transients of that played instrument. But there is a big trade-off, a big potential drawback of using super fast attack times. And that potential drawback is that by smoothing out those transients, by really controlling that attack and really getting that dynamic consistency, you can suck the life out of sounds. You can be getting rid of all the transients, kind of all the breath and life and articulation, along with making them more dynamically consistent. But parallel compression is supposed to be the best of both worlds. So you take this track that is super compressed, that is has a super fast attack, and even though you've kind of squeezed some of the life out of it, you're putting that underneath a track that still has all of those transients still intact, that still has all of that clarity and all that articulation and life that you want in the track. So you're adding those two things together so you can get away with that fast attack time because you're combining it with a track that doesn't have the transients shaved off. So it's kind of a best of both worlds idea. And generally speaking, if you're using super slow attack times on your parallel compressed track, the effect that you're going to have with your parallel compression is just making the transients pop out even more and potentially making things sound even more dynamically uncontrolled because you're essentially raising the level of your initial attacks and initial transients where so much of the dynamics happen. You're just making those dynamics pop out even more and more and more, which in some cases could be a good idea, but most of the time is not what you're looking for when you're looking for parallel compression. You're usually looking to get things more stable, not even more dynamic, even more erratic, even more all over the place in a performance. The last third principle I'll give you is that often when it comes to your parallel compressed tracks, you can get away with faster release times than you might if you were just compressing a sound by itself. Super fast release times have this side effect of bringing up some kind of trash and edge in the signal because it's just being folded in under the main track. And that little bit of extra edge and grit you get from a fast release time can really enhance things. So often you can get away with a slightly faster release time than you might be able to otherwise if you're just directly compressing a track. So those are three big principles and three themes that you're going to find come up again and again when we're talking about specific applications. All right, specific application number one. What's the most common thing probably people use parallel compression on? It's drums. And I've got a couple videos out there where you can see and hear me do parallel compression on drums. But the thing that I try to drive home to people is that when you're parallel compressing drums, it's not just about doing the parallel compression. It's the parallel processing. It's the other stuff. Is notably, in this case, the EQ. And this is the thing a lot of people who are playing around with parallel compression leave off. And that is EQing the bejesus out of your parallel compressed drums. So if you're taking a whole drum kit and then applying parallel processing to it, you're generally going to want to A, use a really fast attack time on those drums, and B, do a bunch of EQ to take out a bunch of mid-range or boost a bunch of low-end and high-end. So you get this really amped up, larger than life, big on bottom, shiny on top, really overly processed parallel compressed drum sound, and that's what you're folding in underneath your main drum tracks. If you don't do any EQ to your parallel compressed bus, Compressing something a ton will generally make it sound a little bit more mid-rangey, a little bit more dark, maybe a little more nasal, maybe a little more boxy, especially when you're using really fast attack times. So using a little bit of EQ to offset that is a good idea. But in the context of a hyper-compressed track you're folding underneath, doing a lot of EQ is a really good idea because some of the things you're looking for are to get a really consistent bottom end out of that kick drum, really consistent attack and articulation out of that snare drum, and then really consistent kind of shine out of those cymbals. And that's what your parallel compressed track is bringing to the table. And enhancing that with a ton of EQ on top and bottom is often a good idea. You can see and hear that and get some more specific examples in my other videos about parallel drum compression. A couple other quick notes about using parallel compression on drums. There are other ways to do it. You could set up a parallel compression bus for your drums that you don't send your cymbals to. Maybe you just send your 
kick, snare, and toms, and compress those together in parallel. And you maybe don't want to apply a tenor parallel compression to cymbals. So that's something to think about. You can think about leaving things out, like spot cymbal mics, or a hi-hat mic, or even maybe your overhead mics, out of your parallel compressed drums. So that's something to think about. Another thing to think about that's very popular, particularly in rock music, is doing parallel compression on specific elements, notably kick and snare, and even more often, snare. And same concepts apply. Usually, you could be doing a super fast attack time to get really consistent level out of that parallel compressed snare. And then you're probably going to be doing some EQ to bring some life and bite and edge and clarity back into that hyper compressed snare. So you're often going to be rolling off a ton of low end on your parallel compressed snare, maybe rolling off high highs to get rid of some cymbal bleed, maybe applying a gate to that parallel compressed snare to get rid of some background noise. Maybe doing some EQ where you try to bring some more crack out of your parallel compressed snare, or maybe in some cases bring up a little bit of the low end. If there's a fundamental frequency around 100 or 200 and you really want the chest in that snare drum, it could be appropriate to add some of that in. So that's something that's popular to do as well. Often with a super fast attack compressor, something like an 1176 has been really popular for this purpose. You can also look at this on any of your individual drum elements rather than just a bus as a whole. So that's thing number one. Second most important and popular thing to use parallel compression and parallel processing on is probably bass. And a really common technique that's super popular is to take your bass and split it into more than one track. And often you might have a low frequency bass and kind of a mid-range and high frequency bass track, and you might blend those two together. And in some cases, you might apply a lot of compression to that more mid-rangey track and high frequency track, and maybe even some saturation too. So this is another way to think about parallel compression. This is not just the compression. It can also be things like band-dependent distortion. We're adding a little bit of edge, a little bit of fuzz, but only to the mid-range and high-frequency components of the bass. This is such a popular trick and technique because getting really good bass, like bass guitar or bass instrument that cuts through on all types of speakers, isn't about putting a ton of low end into it. On your studio monitors, maybe you hear plenty of low end, and when you boost some 60 hertz or 80 hertz or 100 hertz, you hear more bass, and you think that's the best way for people to hear the bass instrument more clearly. But most people aren't listening on your studio monitors. They could be listening on earbuds. They could be listening on a laptop. They could be listening on their phone. That isn't putting out these low frequencies. So really to get bass instruments to come across on a variety of speaker systems and sound good everywhere often requires really thinking about the mid-range and making sure the mid-range of that bass instrument really pushes through in the mix and sometimes applying a little bit of fuzz or distortion or saturation to the mid-range and or high frequency of a bass is going to help it poke through. And making sure that that mid-range is really dynamically consistent and doesn't get lost is going to help that bass poke through. There are a few different ways to do this. One way is that you could take a full range bass track that you maybe compress and treat just ever so slightly, and then you have a parallel track that has just the mid range or just the mid range and high frequency, and you compress that a ton and add some saturation, and you fold the two together. The other way you could do it is a little bit more like a multi band compressor or a multi band processor, like you might find in, say, Isotopes Ozone or Alloy, where you can take this one bass track and break it up into two distinct bands, or even three distinct bands. You could have one track that's low frequency, one track that's mid-range, one track that's all high frequency, and compress and or saturate each of those three bands separately. Alloy or Ozone, those are tools where you could do that kind of all in one, but a lot of people will do this just by splitting it out into three separate tracks and putting EQ filters on them, so you have a low frequency, mid frequency, and high frequency bass. Whichever way you do it, you're often going to be applying different amounts of compression and maybe different amounts of saturation to each of those channels. Or you could be taking one of these parallel process tracks and folding it in alongside a full range track. Another application, 808s, 
We talked about drums. We talked about bass. This is somewhere in between an 808, like a sample kick that you find in EDM and house and hip hop in a bunch of modern pop styles as well. And 808s often are going to have a similar kind of thing done to them where they might get split into two. You might have a full range version of the 808 and then a second parallel process version of the 808 where the important thing isn't compression necessarily, but maybe parallel saturation once again, a little bit of extra distortion or grit or edge being added just to the mid and high frequencies of that instrument, and then blending the two together. You could potentially also do some compression, but in the case of something like an 808, it'd probably be done a little bit more for reshaping or tone rather than dynamic consistency, because an 808 probably should be pretty dynamically consistent in most cases. All right, we've covered three big ones that are probably some of the most common places to use parallel processing. But another one, also important and sometimes overlooked by people who are new to the game of music production, and that's vocals. I mean, chances are you're probably already doing some type of parallel processing on vocals, right? Because you're using maybe reverbs or delays in parallel. You're sending out to a bus. That's a type of parallel processing. Or you can even put a reverb plug in right in your vocal and use that mix knob, you know, to change it, you know, from 100% to 20%. That's a kind of parallel processing. But I'm talking about going beyond that and also thinking about parallel compression on vocals. And this is a trick that goes way back into the days of Motown in the 1960s. They were using tricks like this, where they would take a main vocal and not over-treat it, not hit it too hard, but then duplicate that vocal. And this second parallel vocal would have a ton of compression applied to it and would be really, really bright, maybe a ton of EQ added to it to really bring out some of the articulation and clarity. Now, there's a potential problem when you are having a really bright, heavily compressed parallel vocal. And that is, if you're using a slow attack time, what's not going to get compressed? Your S's and T's and stuff like that. Sally sells seashells by the seashore. Your sibilance could really pop out. So this is another one of those places where it really makes a lot of sense to focus on fast attack compression in the context of parallel compression. Just like in drums, using super fast attacks in your parallel compressed vocals are super important so that A, you have the dynamic control, but B, you don't have a ton of sibilance poking out. So using a really fast attack compressor, maybe even a de along with brightening up and adding some edge and clarity and maybe saturation and clarity to your vocals becomes super important. So using parallel processing to enhance vocals in that way, great idea. Next place, where are we up to? This is going to be five now. Pianos. Pianos are one of these funny elements where if you record a real piano and you try to fit it into like a dense mix, man, it is so easy for them to get lost. And often to make a piano really kind of come through a dense mix, you might need to do a ton of processing to it. And you'll find that real pianos in the context of rock and pop kind of mainstream mixes can have a ton of low end taken out of them, a ton of low mids taken out of them, to the point where they sound pretty terrible if you're going to hear them by themselves. And in a really dense mix, you could be applying gobs and gobs of compression to that main piano to kind of make it sit there. And you may need to use serial compression. That's two compressors kind of back to back, one going into another. So to kind of even out the attack on that piano, you may need a really super fast attack compressor. But then to kind of bring some of the life and sparkle and transient initial impact back into the sound, it might then go through a slow attack compressor afterwards. So you have a first compressor shaving off those transients, making them super consistent so we can get this piano into a dense mix and make sure certain notes don't get lost. But then putting that whole thing through a slow attack compressor brings those transients out just enough so that we're not losing all the edge and clarity. But in a mix that's not super dense, you could take this approach on a parallel compressed track where you're leaving the main piano more or less alone and kind of letting it be natural. But then you might have a parallel 
hyper-compressed, hyper-EQ'd piano track that you fold in under that main piano. And maybe in the densest sections of the song, you bring up that parallel compressed piano even more. So you're bringing up that hyper-compressed, bright piano, but only when you need it. And then, then in the sections that are a little bit more sparse, you can kind of lay back on this parallel compressed track and let the more natural and kind of unmanipulated piano sound shine through a little bit more. Man, there's so many more places we could talk about using parallel processing, but the last really big one is probably going to be on your main mix bus. And this is super easy. A lot of great compressors will have a mix knob built right into them, so you can get a good compression sound going on your mix bus, and then instead of doing it 100%, you can back it off to 90 or 80% or whatever. But there are other ways to use parallel compression and parallel processing on the mix bus. One of them that I think is notable is this idea of compressing the rear bus differently than the main bus. What does that mean? This is, I'm going to give you a little bit of audio history here that you don't need to necessarily remember, but in the 1970s, I think it was, they came out with something called Quad, where they were trying to hook people on this idea of you get two speakers for the front, and then you get two speakers for the back, and you have like this early version of surround sound. Never really took off, but there were some consoles made that would have two stereo buses for like the master bus section. And you can fold them down together for like the stereo mix. And what people discovered is, hey, we could have two separate mixes going. So we could have a mix bus that has everything in it and then a separate mix bus that doesn't have everything in it. And that separate second mix bus, we could compress that one really hard. So a technique that became popular back then was sending everything to the main bus and then to our parallel, our second bus, we'd send, say, everything except for the drums and then compress that super hard. So you'd get a ton of compression on the really important instruments and kind of mid-range instruments or things like vocals or guitars or keyboards or whatever's driving the main thrust of the song. But you're not having the compressor react and really get sucked down by things like kick drum hits and snare drum hits. And you're not having the drums, often the loudest, highest amplitude thing in the mix, be controlling the compression on everything else. So you could have a really heavy compressed everything folded in with the main mix bus where you don't get all the pumping of drum compression. So that's an interesting technique to get less pumping out of your main mix bus, getting some more squeeze on the really important mid-range elements that a lot of people really focus on when they're listening to the record. So that's an idea. Setting up a second mix bus where you're selectively leaving things out of it, compressing that super hard and bringing it up underneath. We could probably do an entire video just on the idea of parallel buses and how to use them. We've had interviews here with Michael Brower, who's famous for some techniques like that. And uh, we've done some deep dives on how he sets up his stuff. And we can go down some rabbit holes here. We could start thinking about how a side chain in your bus compressor is kind of a parallel technique where you're using a parallel bus to trigger your compressor, but then that compressor compresses everything. And some mixed bus compressors will have side chains built right in where you can roll off low frequencies so your kick drum and your bass aren't triggering your mix bus compressor too much. And that's a related idea. But instead of going down any more rabbit holes, I think we've gone pretty deep and pretty far on parallel compression. But the last quick note I want to give you on bus processing in the parallel domain is that there's something that I've done exactly two times in my life on mixes. And maybe it'll work for you too. There was a client of mine, I remember, where he had rough mixes that he liked, and I did new mixes for him, and he generally liked my mixes way better, except there was like one song where he's like, I, there's something in my rough that I really like that you're not capturing with the mix that you did. Can you try you know, an alternate mix? And we did a few revisions. And he had this crazy idea, not being an engineering person, you know, beholden to the unspoken rules of engineering that could you just like mix my mix together with your mix? And me being the open-minded person I was and hopefully still am said, sure, why not? That sounds totally wrong and like something you're not supposed to do, but let's try it and see if it works. And it worked and it sounded great. And the sum of our two mixes mixed together sounded better than either of our mixes. I can't remember the exact ratios and proportions. And, you know, I'll actually admit that the only version of that mix he had was an MP3. 
So it was a high quality MP3 mixed with my high resolution WAV file together, making the final mix that sounded better than either of them. And it came out great. And no one ever knew our horrible secret. And this is a big thing about music production, right? If it sounds good, it is good. Don't get too precious about your audio. You're allowed to break rules. You're allowed to make mistakes in the name of it sounding good. All right, that gets us through mix bus. That actually gets us through all of the places that you're most likely to use parallel compression, parallel processing. But I want to give you one more idea, something I told you I would get into, which is places not to use parallel processing. Or really, more accurately, places that like you don't need to use parallel processing most of the time. And the context there is electronic music, EDM, music where things are really heavily sampled. I mean, there are exceptions to this, right? Like an 808, that's a sampled instrument. Parallel processing can be smart on it. But the idea of parallel compression, the same way you conventionally would use it on a played bass guitar or a played drum kit or sung vocals, it's just not as relevant. And your more powerful tools than compression in general in this context of electronic music tends to be things like EQ and effects. Because a really super important thing with electronic music is sample selection. And if things really aren't sounding right, like choose a new sample or layer in an additional sample. And you're also not going to have that same problem you do with live drums or live performed basses of dynamic inconsistency. And that's one of the main things with parallel processing is that it allows you to get dynamic consistency. It allows you to do really fast attacks to get super dynamic consistency and then fold that in under a live perform thing that has all of the dynamics and transients and life still in it. So it's this compromise where you get control of the impact, a greater sense of dynamic consistency, but still the life of transients. And that doesn't really matter in electronic music, EDM, that kind of stuff, because the drums are already super consistent. And if you want to reshape the attack of a drum or the sustain of a drum, you could do that like with a transient design or something like that, a transient designer plugin, or by choosing a new sample or layering with a new sample. And I would say that parallel compression and compression in general becomes a little less important on individual elements. And especially parallel compression becomes a little less important in the context of electronic music than it does in, say, rock music. That's not to say there's no place for parallel processing in electronic music. There absolutely is. And there's absolutely a place for a ton of bus processing and multi-bus processing and compressors kind of gluing things together and, and helping things kind of breathe and live together. So I'm not saying don't compress and don't use parallel compression, but that idea of just applying parallel compression to your whole drum mix or to a bass might not be as relevant when everything is like MIDI programmed as when it's performed live. So that's an additional idea I want to give you. Well, I hope this one has been useful for you. If you want to go even deeper into ideas like this with me, we got some free workshops. We've got the full-length courses. You can check out the five habits of every great mixer totally for free. We weave together the common threads and the approach of all of the amazing mixers that I've interviewed over the years who have appeared at MixCon, that kind of thing. Check it out over at sonicscoop.com slash mixhabits. That's sonicscoop.com slash mixhabits. And find out the five things you should be doing in every mix that you might not be doing yet, that all the great mixers do. If you want a free intro to mastering, you can check that out for free over at Mastering101, that's sonicscoop.com slash Mastering101, where you can get the free intro to mastering, learn what it's all about, what tools we use, how we use them. And if you want to go super deep, of course, we've got the full-length courses like Mixing Breakthroughs and Mastering Demystified, both of which come with a full money-back guarantee. I think you're going to love them. There's hours upon hours of instruction in those courses that can dramatically improve your speed, efficiency, and results in mixing, or in the case of Mastering Demystified, tell you everything that you need to know about mastering to get started doing it well at a high level. All right, big shout out and thanks to our sponsors on this week's episode, Sound Toy sponsoring once again, making some of the best creative mixing effects in the known universe, many of which have a mix knob on them, which is absolutely great for parallel processing. Also, big shout out and thanks to Focusrite, making some of the best interfaces out there from the entry-level Scarlett series all the way up to the high-end RedNet series. And that Scarlett line is probably 
the best-selling interface line in history. And for good reason, it is really hard to get better bang for the buck than you're going to out of Focusrite. All right. Thanks again for hanging out with me. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. See you next time.